Hello and welcome to another session of our Arizona Hip Historian Virtual Happy Hour Tour. I am Brenda Holt with Arizona AARP. We are the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. With a nationwide presence and nearly 38 million members across the nation, and approximately 900,000 right here in Arizona, we work to strengthen communities and we advocate for what matters most to families. During the month of October, we will raise awareness on Medicare and Social Security decisions that focus on enhancing your financial health. AARP is a wise friend and fierce defender and a trusted source of Medicare and Social Security information and resources. To find these resources, please visit us at aarp.org backslash social security aarp.org backslash Medicare. And for more information, please visit us at aarp.org backslash Arizona. Enjoy your session. Hello and good evening. I am so happy that you can join us here for Arizona History Happy Hour. Thank you so much for being here. Now, I know some of you are watching on, we've got Twitch, LinkedIn. I know Frank's probably watching on LinkedIn, as well as Twitter and Facebook, which most of you are watching on, as well as I know a few of you actually like YouTube as well. So today is October 6th. 2022. Hello, October. Hello, hello, cool weather. And you know, there's all kinds of things going on. Why back on this date, back in 1906, there was a meteor shower, which lit up the sky. But you know, for those folks who didn't see the lights, which people could say that they could sit on their front porch and watch the light show up above, they also heard those meteorites when they collide with the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, phone calls went up across the state with people talking about how there was either an earthquake or an explosion. Now, also on October 6th, it is also National Badger Day. Now, you know, these animals are not just short-legged. You might think they're furry, cute fellas, but you know, when provoked, they can be quite vicious. It is also National Orange Wine Day, which you can take a bold sip of this ancient method of winemaking. It's a little known style that shines and produces a wine of an auburn color. And more on that in just a bit. It is also Mad Hatter Day. On this day, it's okay to blow milk out your nose. Wear, sil wear silly hats, just make fun all day, maybe even walking backwards. Anything that would make Lewis Carroll proud. It is also National Cerebral Palsy Day to raise awareness of the fact that 17 million people are impacted by this disease. It's one of the most common physical disabilities and mainly affecting mo mainly children and on through life because there is no cure. It is also National Do Noodle Day. Now, do you know noodles have been around for over 4,000 years and come in flat, round, twisted shit, sheets, um, you know, tubes, little, or araketa, the little, little ears. I mean, so many different shapes, but also made of things of buckwheat, wheat. And now you can even get zucchini noodles. So all different kinds of ways to enjoy noodles. And today would be a great day to do just that. So what can you expect on tonight's show? Well, we always do a little bit of trivia. We have Little Arizona, as well as music history. We also, of course, have a beverage. You might have a clue what that is. 
We also do from the vault, which is something that you might see or be very close by and just not know the full story of, as well as we have a guest. Now, if this is your first time watching, you might wonder, who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, you know, my name is Marshall Shore, and I moved here about 22 years ago. Well, actually, gosh, you know, I can almost get ready to say 23 years. Wow. So, started off, I was actually working in Brooklyn at a Carnegie Library, decided to trade that cold, that wind, that snow for something that you can't shovel, sunshine. And that led me to a little library in South Phoenix, and there was a rich oral tradition of the community. And so that got me learning about Arizona in a different way. Now, also, when we got to Arizona, we mu promptly moved into this beautiful 1956 ranch, which is pretty much a time capsule because there's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, working appliances. In fact, some friends call our house the Unmuseum because... It's a living museum. <laughs> now, as soon as we got here, all I kept hearing about how there was no history. But I quickly learned every time I went somewhere, whether it was on foot, on a bike, in a car, on a bus, I kept running across so many amazing people, places, and stories. And that got me looking at Arizona history in a very different way and talking about it in a different way. Then there was also that post-war boom. All those GIs that either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on the way to somewhere else. And after the war, they were moving here in huge numbers. And forever changing Arizona. Now, I also called the hip historian. And, you know, October is typically a busy month. And, you know, this October is kind of that same way. So actually we are pre-recording this because tonight I am at the Grand for a local buzz mixer. As well as this coming Saturday, we also have Haunted History Walking Tour of downtown Phoenix. That's always a lot of fun. You can find out more information about that on hiphistorian.com. Also, um, next week, I will be at the Arizona State Fair. We'll be doing bingo and Arizona music history. So that's going to be a lot of fun, playing some music through those loudspeakers at the State Fair so everybody can hear. Then I'm also going to be up in Kingman for their Route 66 Fest. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Then this week, actually this Friday, uh, for First Friday, I'm down at a new space just off of 7th Avenue on Turney, talking about 7th Avenue and some of the history that's there. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be in Yuma, and we're actually going to be broadcasting from Yuma. So that's going to be a lot of fun as we're there for the Arizona State Historic Preservation Conference. And I'm excited to say that the end of this month, on the 22nd, we are launching a bus tour after three years. Excited to be able to do that. So look forward to having some of you join us on that bus tour. It's going to be a lot of fun. And you might see one of the stops that we're going to make right there. Also, then right after Thanksgiving, going to be down in Bisbee for dinner and a seance at the historic Greenway House with my friends Francine and Debbie. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Now, remember, you can always reach out to me, whether you found the chat. You can also reach out through Facebook, Instagram, email, or even my website. Now, you know, happy hour means cocktail. Well, at least, you know, some people say it does. And so that is PJ. He is kind of my cocktail advisor. And so because today is National Orange Wine, you know, when I first saw that, I was wondering, what does orange wine mean? I was kind of scared. I, I kept having flashbacks of like Boone's Hill strawberry wine, something along that lines, but happy to say no. Now, PJ has also been doing some things with Belly, which just opened up out in Gilbert. And they have a wide selection, including orange wine and a 
other wines as well. This is Kerner from Slovenia. And so you can see it's got a, it's named for the color, not because it's got orange in it. Now, I think what they do is something about they leave the, the grapes are not peeled when they make the wine. Don't know if I have that right. So I'm sure if some, somebody may know more about it, be like, wait a minute, that's not what we're doing with that wine. Oh, and that's quite lovely. All right. So there you have orange wine, which also is a great day to celebrate orange wine because it's it's special day. Now we're going to talk about Little Arizona, which is, I always like to highlight a small town across Arizona. Small can mean a variety of things. And so, oh, and actually I forgot to change that county. It's not Pinal County, it's Mojave County. And we are talking about Peach Springs, which is up on old Route 66, not far from Seligman, is just over 1,300 residents. And so it is on historic Route 66. And as you drive through Peach Springs, you can see that old highway history. There are a couple old gas stations that are still standing that are kind of fun to take a look at. But, you know, it is also the home of the Wallapai. They have been there long term, far longer than Route 66. Um, there is also the Wallapai Lodge there. And so you can also go visit the Grand Canyon Skywalk Glass Bridge, which is a glass bottom bridge hovering about 4,000 feet above the Grand Canyon. And Peach Springs is the gateway to that bridge. You can also go visit the Grand Canyon Caverns, where another place you can stay is at the very bottom, and it is listed as probably one of, it's one of the 10 most unique places to stay in all the world. And then you get access to the caverns after everything else is shut down. All right. So, you know, it wouldn't be a happy hour without a special guest as well. And so I would like to bring on my really good friend. You know, and here on Happy Hour, we always have an amazing guest. And tonight is no different than that. So I want to bring on my good friend, James Garcia. Hello. Hello, Marshall. How are you, man? I am good. And yourself? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for being here. So for folks who don't know much about you or anything about you, tell us a little about There's yourself. Probably a lot of people. <laughs> You're wondering, who is this man? They probably want that bit about me as well. I mean, that, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you, you want me to give you just a little bit about me? Yeah, just a little bit about yourself. Uh, oh, okay. I'm, um, I'm a writer. Uh, I am a journalist. I'm a playwright. Uh, I do communications, um, uh, PR stuff, um, uh, speech writing. So kind of anything that needs a written word, that's what I do. Um, but a lot of my world revolves around uh, journalism and, and theater. Ah, very and good. Originally from uh, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, traveled all over the country, lived all over the country with my mom growing up. Um, sometimes for no more than three to six months at a time. So I've been kind of a little bit everywhere and uh, landed here in Phoenix uh, 20 years ago because I met my wife at a journalism conference and uh, we decided to get married and I moved here and I've been here ever since. Ah, very cool. The magic of a conference. There you go. Yes. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. We, we, we didn't. We like to tell people we did not meet um, uh, at three other conferences that we both attended uh, and then finally met at this one. So. So I guess this was the fourth time was a charm. Indeed. Was there, was there an open bar involved? Oh, of course. Okay, lots, very good. Lots, lots of tequila. <laughs> <laughs> lots <Nice>. of tequila. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So tonight we have trivia like every, every week. And so now our trivia is a little unique here because what we'll do is it's not like bar trivia where it's like we're going to tell you the answer, then move on to the next thing and we're done. So the fun of this is we're actually going to go through all the trivia questions that are all multiple choice. 
And then we'll take a little bit of an Arizona music break and then come back and talk about those answers. So now people keep track. It's like, I know Anita has a very special notebook she uses. I've got one friend that keeps sending me photos of a body part that he keeps writing on. (laughs) So his arm, his leg, someone else's arm, someone else's leg. So, you know, it's all good wherever you want to keep track of it. Some folks even do it in the chat. So whatever makes you happy. Was the, was the body part like a, a an obscure reference to the Dahmer series now? Or what was that? Oh, <laughs> it was before all of that. And, you know, and I'm always shocked when people are going, oh, it's very disturbing. Well, no. <laughs> well, what did you think it was going to be? Yes. It's, it's not yes. a musical. No, it's not a musical. Yeah. So. Murder porn is what I call it. Murder porn. <laughs> You know, gro- I mean, growing up, I was in Indiana and it was like, I'm like, yeah, I have lots no of murder porn in Indiana. I live there. I too. have no interest in watching that at all. So. All right. So our first trivia question is number one. Who was Arizona's first and only ever Latino governor? Was it A, Raul C. Castro, B, Fidel Castro, C, Royal H. Castro or Cesar Chavez. So who do you think was Arizona's first and only Latino governor? Question two. Now you might have to help me in the pronunciation just because how do you pronounce Miami? Well, <laughs> how do you pronounce Miami, Arizona? And then people are saying, well, it well exactly. Miami, or, or how do you pronounce Miami, Arizona or I mean, Miami, how you, Arizona? How do people from Miami, Arizona pronounce it? So, yeah, so it's, uh, let's see what we have. Miami, Miami, me, uh, me, <laughs> and, <laughs> me don't, and me don't know. Me don't know. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's one yeah, of those. So, this is not right. a trick question. It's one of those. One of those it, indeed, it is one of those. And it's so funny. So, yeah, but it's kind of like, how do you pronounce Miami, Arizona? All right. And people from Miami or Miami or Miami will correct you. Like, <laughs> or me don't know. Like they, you will meet you, you will meet them, and they will correct you. They they will tell you. Uh, well, you know, this reminds me of um, the old Abbott Costello. Yeah. Who's on first? What's on yeah. second? I don't know. Third base. Yeah, it's a little like that. <laughs> All right. Question three: What was the name of the Arizona's Class B nineteen fifty one championship basketball team? Was it A the Mighty Vikings? B, the Superior Cowboys. C, the Bohemian Rhapsodies. You know, I bet they were a bunch of queens. They were. They were they, they, yeah. <laughs> one of them, oddly, one of them was an astrophysicist. It's very strange. <laughs> or D, the Mighty Vandals. So, all right. So one of those was the, was the name of Arizona's Class B 1951 championship basketball team. Mm-hmm. All right. Question. Incredible team, by the way. A team that high school team that was scoring over 100 points a game towards the end of the season. High wow. school. And, you know, and, the, and they weren't like full professional NBA quarters. These were high school quarters, right? Which are like a little shorter. Um, wow. Yeah. So it's a great story. I look forward to hearing all about that soon. All right. So question four. What was the single most stringent anti-immigration bill passed in Arizona history? Was it A? Senate Bill 1492. Very good year. Indeed. I hear the ocean sailed the ocean blue. Yeah. Um, Let's see. And B, Senate Bill 1070. Senate Bill 1864. Ironically, the same year that Arizona's territory passed an abortion bill, right? The anti-abortion bill. Uh, Oh, that's right. How could, yeah, how could that happen in the same year? Or D, Senate Bill 90210, which is a, was a popular zip code, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> All right, question five. Who was the only Puerto Rican ever appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court? Was it A, Sonny, Sonny Bono? Sonny Bono. A lot of people don't know Sonny's uh, Puerto Rican. <laughs> <laughs> B, T- Tito Puente the third. Mm-hmm. C J Lo mm-hmm. or D Sonia Sotomayor. So one of those is the only Puerto Rican ever appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Who do you think it is? 
All right, going on to question six. What is a pastorella? A, a Mexican pastry that tastes like an apple strudel. B, a Mexican theatrical performance used to convert Indians to Catholicism. C, the opening band for Menudo in the mid 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, later. Is that before or after Ricky Martin? <laughs> This is during Ricky Martin. Oh, Joe, during Ricky Martin. Okay. Yeah. And, and then I think later Black Sabbath opened for them. You know, so it was, yeah. <laughs> this is early. This is early. Okay. This would have been the early yeah. menudo. Yeah. All right. Um, or D, a kind of menudo served only in Guanajuato, Guanajuato in October. Actual name of the city. Guanajuato, Indeed. Guanajuato. Mm -hmm. All right. So, question seven. What is an American pastorella? A, a political satire about Mexican pastries. B, a political satire written by James Garcia. About Mexican pastries. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I getting hungry all of a sudden? <laughs> all right. C, a cooking show hosted by Edward James Almos. Which or we D want to see, right? We want to see this show, <laughs> right? Well, he's well, he's making Mexican pastries. That's what he's making in the show. And I want him to be in character from American Me, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, using his switchblade for other purposes than your. Well, stand. you got to cut the butter somehow. Yeah. yeah. And D, a weekly program that airs Sunday that you must watch or go straight to hell. So, which one of those do you think is the correct answer? Moving on to number eight. Hispanic Heritage Month is September 15th to October 15th. And why should anyone who's not Hispanic care? Mm -hmm. A, because Hispanics care about you. Mm -hmm. Very much. B, because every major beer distributor in the U.S. wants you to care. Mm -hmm. Very, very much. Especially on Cinco de Mayo. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, see, there are no, now... they love, they, no, they love Hispanic Heritage Month because it's like a whole month or so beer. You know, Cinco de Mayo is just like basically <laughs> one weekend, right? So, oh, yeah. Cinco de Mayo, by the way, the, uh, the cartoonist Lalo Alcaraz calls Drinko de Mayo, right? Like, yeah, which it, which it has become in the U.S. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, see, there are 62.6 million Hispanic, Latino, Latin ex Americans in the U.S. Mm -hmm. or D the statistical odds that your children are married to a Hispanic has grown. So which one of those do you think is why we should all care about Hispanic Her Heritage Month? Question nine, what job has James E. Garcia? That's you. This is, this is me, this is I. All right. Oh, the, the, yes, I. Uh, <laughs> in his long, dubiously illustrious professional career, have has he been a a prison librarian, mm -hmm. b a journalist, c a university professor, d a playwright, e a farm worker, f a factory worker, or g all of the above. So one of those is the correct answer. Each of these, uh, by the way, requires skilled labor. Right? So this is the this is you know the beauty of all of these careers. Oh, and yes, you can't it, just it, fall into these things. Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah. No, yeah. you can't. You can't just like show up and do them. I mean, no, you show I, up I, and try, you don't know what you're doing. Them. Yeah, if you just show up and don't know what you're doing, people just mock you. Right? So indeed all right and our last question is what does the e in james e garcia stand for is it a eduardo b excelsior c evil d evite e depends on his wife's mood or f none of the above so what do you think the e stands for in james's middle name all right. Well, while you are all trying to lock in your final answers, we are going to take a little bit of an Arizona music break, and we are going to talk about Lalo Guerrero, who is considered to be the father of Chicano music. I love Lalo Guerrero. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he's recorded over 700 songs, originally from Tucson. I didn't realize he was one of 21 siblings. 
Oh my God. Only nine of them survived. Yeah. Oh, wow. My, fa my father was one of 20, 18 survived. Oh, good 18. gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh man. And when they started to go, lots of funerals back to back. Yeah. Yeah. And he credits his mother, who was really the one who taught him to embrace the spirit of being Chicano through his music. Now, I think it's really cool because he was represented Arizona at the 1939 World's Fair. He also wrote music that became the musical Zoot Suit. Um, his son, Dan, took one of his songs, Poncho Claws, and made a children's book out of it with illustrations by Bob Mackey. Now, he also did a lot of, he did a wide variety of music. He wrote also songs about Cesar Chavez and other farm workers, as well as things like There's No Tortillas to the tune of O Sola Mio. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he which, was. Which I can sing for you later, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. And all, but, but every genre you can imagine. Boogie Woogie, you know, a little bit of jazz, rancheras, uh, traditional Mexican music, um, uh, parodies uh, in English, uh, one of which crossed over. I think it was, I think it might have been Pancho Claus that crossed over into um, English language radio. Uh, the guy wrote multiple genres and you write hundreds of songs. Yeah. I mean, and I, and, you know, and his son, Dan, is so nice. Oh my gosh. And so. So, yeah. So, you know, I mean, I'm Lalo Guerrero. I mean, I love the fact that most people don't realize he was from Arizona. Yeah. And somehow distantly related to Linda Ronstadt, too. But I, I forget exactly how. They're somehow connected. Well, I, oh, OK. Because yeah. I knew I knew they were like close friends, like with the families. Yeah. And so... I think they're, they're somehow related, like distantly, indirectly, somewhere. Yeah. Uh, now, are you, are you working on any sort of a project or anything about Lalo? Oh, so yes, I'm glad. I'm glad you 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 asked me that question <laughs> completely unprompted, spontaneously. <laughs> 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 so, so I had been so uh, I've been talking to Dan for years. Dan Dan has been for years trying to make a musical about his father, right? And his father's. Oh, I didn't realize he's because I know he did one about himself. No, no, yeah, he did a play by himself, but he's been trying for years, um, and he's tried here and there and everywhere. Uh, and just hasn't been able to like put it together, right? And and, uh, and it would be a big project, would be a major project, right? So, um, uh, so I have been around in some of those conversations and actually tried to connect him with some people in the Gamage Auditorium and this and that, and nothing's ever really quite come of it. And um, and so I spoke to him just a few months ago about the prospect of creating uh, at least writing a script because I'm a playwright, right? And um, I'm not a musician but i can write a book uh and and the play would use all of his own music um and he's got hundreds of songs so it would be a matter of going through his catalog to kind of figure out what works uh and uh and so that's that's where i am with it it's just you know kind of on spec you know and he was like well let's give it a try and write something and send it to me and you know so that's that's where it is but in the meantime i also want to do a um a one man show that would essentially be acoustic that would be based on, I wish I had the book handy, but it's called, um, it's a bit, it's, it's basically a memoir by Lalo Guerrero. Uh, ah. and, yeah. And it's, um, uh, and it's just him sort of talking about his life. Right. Uh, and so I, I want to do something that's like a one act, one man show. And I do play a little guitar and probably enough to, enough to fake Lalo Guerrero songs and, uh, and, and do that, um, as well. So this, this, he's always sort of on my mind. Uh, and on my mind, because he, he literally crossed so many genres and performed way into his 80s. I mean, he may, I don't know. I, I don't remember exactly how old he was when he finally passed away. But um, it was uh, he, he performed. Uh, I met him at Damage Auditorium uh, years ago in a, in a performance that he did there. And he was hilarious. And his comedic timing was fantastic. And, um, you know, and, and I went up and shook his hand and said, I, I'd love to write a play about you. And then a couple of years later, he was gone. I'm like, damn it, I missed my shot, you know. And I, <laughs> but maybe not. <laughs> but I did run into Dan because Dan um, has a one-man show that he tours. And somehow we connected on that and helped promote it lo locally and this and that. And so, yeah, so now we have a connection. Well, it was funny. That was actually the last thing I did before COVID hit. He was showing his movie up in Sedona at the film festival. Mm -hmm. So I went. Oh, oh the documentary. 
Yes. Yeah. The yeah. Um, Gatino. So I went up there to go see that and he was there. And so it was nice to get a chance to actually chat with him. And. Oh, wait, well, was there a film? Cause I know the documentary that he produced and wrote about his dad's life. Oh no, this is the oh. one that was about him. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm not familiar with that. Particular one. Oh yeah. Those, no, actually... know, I've seen a play version of Gatino. So yeah. So he did it on stage. He did it here locally and then wound up turning it into a movie. I didn't know that. I didn't know it turned into a movie. So yeah. So wow. it was really good. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, and the documentary about his dad, I believe is called La Lugarero, the original Chicano. Ah. Which is actually where I first came, came to know him because I was working at the time for KJZZ as a reporter uh, and, uh, and it was going to air on PBS. And so I ended up doing a feature for KJZZ. And I think that same piece also ran on National Public Radio. Um, and I think that's how I first connected with Dan. Ah, okay. I mean, Dan is such a nice guy. Yeah. yeah. Full of energy and creativity. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 All right. So now we're going to go for some answers. All right. So question one, who was Arizona's first and only ever Latino governor? Mm -hmm. Raul Hector Castro. Ah. Mm -hmm. By the way, and Castro, by the way, crossed undocumented in 1918. Uh, And I know this in part because I wrote a play about him called American Dreamer, The Life and Times of Raul H. Castro. And I call it American Dreamer because to me, he was like the original Arizona dreamer. In, in, in the same way that we have so many dreamers now. So indeed, so so I know you've you've written about him. Have you done anything with that? Oh yeah, I, I well, I've written a full length play about him. I've performed it um, on and off in, over the years. Uh, I just recently did a, a little excerpt from it, if you will. I, there's a, a a woman in Tucson who's written a children's book about him called Ralito which was published by Arte Publico Press out of Houston. They do a lot of uh, Latino authors. Uh, and, uh, and she and I um, did a, a, we've done this thing a couple of times now where we just show up to public schools. We went to um, uh, uh, Peterson Middle School in the Cartwright School District here in Phoenix. And she um, played herself, if you will, as the author uh, and interviewed me in character as Raul H. Castro about my um, nearly 100 year life. Uh, and um, and so I did that all in character, and we did it for an audience of eighteen hundred fifth graders. That was a crowd. That was a, the energy was astounding. <laughs> but I was, oh my I, gosh, was so, I can only I imagine. So, I was so afraid at one moment that, that at one point they were like they were get so excited they would just rush the stage, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and chaos would just ensue but no but they were so fun and they were uh, they were amazingly attentive and responsive and they loved Raul Castro the the character and but then at the very end I I had the last time we did this I didn't do this but this time around at the very end I said and by the way I'm going to you know I want the author to come up now and I want you children to know that I am an actor I am not actually Raul H Castro and I had to do this because the last time a lot of kids thought that I was the governor right that I was 106 years old or something in the and looking pretty good <laughs> in, fact, in fact i did say to them i said i am viejito i am an old man i'm a viejito but i'm not that old you know i'm an actor <laughs> i wanted them i wanted them to know right but but they loved they loved that there was this governor who was a boxer who was a who was a U.S. ambassador, who was all of these. He was a judge. He was all sorts of things. He was a hobo at one point. Oh, I didn't know that. The guy had an astounding... Yeah, he rode the rails for a while during the Depression uh, and and, and made a living. And this is after he had gone to college. Made a living boxing, because he had been a a championship boxer in the Southwest, and, and picking crops, right? And he just traveled all over the country until his brother called him one day and said, Raul, I'm quitting school. And, and Raul was like, why? He said, well, I don't like it. And, you know, it's no good. And it's not going to do me any good. Look at you. You went to college and you're a bum. And, and so then he felt bad and he came home and got a job <laughs> working for all the, of all things, the State Department, like during World War II, the U.S. State Department. on the business. Oh, wow. Yeah. Spying on, on a Mexican and Japanese businessmen and German businessmen. That's what he was like doing. He was a spy for a while. <laughs> this is a sounding light yeah. from hobo to spy hobo to spy <laughs> wow yeah all right so how do you pronounce miami arizona 
Yeah, it's my Emma. It's my Emma. If As opposed to, to that place in people. Florida. Yeah, it's not Miami. It's my Emma. I have no idea why. I keep asking people from my Emma why, and they don't. No one really has a good answer. Uh, and um, you know, we, we should we should get another historian on here sometime to you know to answer that question, uh, Marshall. You know, I, you know I'm trying, it's like you know, I'm wondering there must be like an Arizona linguist. You would think, I'm right? sure somebody, you know, I'm that's actually, I'm that would be kind of fun to track down and try to find out why if, is it if you know the or, answer, find me on Facebook and tell us why. Either, well, you know, and I wouldn't be shocked when this actually go when this actually airs that yeah. somebody may be like, oh, I know why yeah. it's like because my great great grandfather said it that way once at some political rally and it stuck <laughs> or something. Well, except that theory doesn't work because in Oklahoma, there is a town spelled the same way in which they also pronounce it my Emma. So there's something, something's Maybe going it's on. in the water. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if you squint your eyes, that you misspell it on purpose. I have no idea. <laughs> but I love that. I love that if you meet people from Miami who you don't even know are from Miami, right? Because a lot of people, what, what, one of the things about Miami is that people um, leave there. It's a small town. It's, you know, used to be a thriving mining community. It is no longer a thriving mining community. So you know, so if you want to, you know, get ahead and do, you move to the big city or you go somewhere else. Right. And and so you will run into people routinely like uh, Paul Luna, who heads the Helios Foundation, uh, is from Miami, um, the former state senate. Uh, no, who, who is it? Who else? Yeah, I think I think the uh, um, former gubernatorial candidate and one time state senator, um, uh, his, his name will uh, uh, come to me in a moment. Uh, but you'll meet these people and um, uh and you'll be in conversation and somehow and, and, and I'll have a conversation with them about this play that I wrote called The Mighty Vandals. Right. And so the, and then they'll, they'll they'll say Miami. You know, I'll say Miami or somebody will say Miami in the ground. They'll connect to Miami. Yeah. But you always think it's, it's so interesting because I think it's like that globe Miami. It's um, you've got also former Governor Rose Mofford. Came yeah. From that area. So, yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah. I think she's from Globe. Yeah, I think. Right. Yeah. 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 There's a great, by the way, there's a great, uh, if you love history, there's a great sports museum in Miami uh, that is is built in the former gymnasium. Oh, the actually, gymnasium, I've been there. Yeah, of the high school. Of right? the, high, the school, high school, right. School I was there for an down. event, and it's like, and there it is. Yeah, high school got torn down. You go in this gymnasium, half of it is filled with books. The other half is a sports museum, and they have, like, beautiful memorabilia and cool stuff, and it's, it's, it's cool. It's worth stopping in if you're in that area. And you might wonder, why do they have all that? And that brings up this next question. What was the name of Arizona's Class B 1951 championship basketball team? The Mighty Vandals. The name of the team and the name of my play, because it couldn't be any other name. I couldn't give the play any other name. <laughs> this, this title writes itself. You know, Great story, not just because... It, this is why I like the story. This has a lot to do with the kind of work I do as a playwright. Uh, why I like the story was not just because they were a great basketball team. You know, that's good. Right? They were undefeated, scoring like more than 100 points a game for a high school team towards the end of, the, the end of that season. They were just astounding. Um, and um, uh, But the, the real reason I wrote it was because it was 1951, three years before Brown versus Board. You know, um, uh, it's my math, 14 years before uh, the Civil Years, 13 years before the U.S. Civil Rights Act, et cetera. And, and this was a predominantly Mexican-American, Mexican, Slovak, uh, immigrant basketball team uh, that went undefeated. Uh, and, uh, and, and, but they lived kind of dual lives because on the, on the court, they were superstars. You know, everybody loves a winner, right? So, you know, all the white people loved that they were winning, right? And, and, but then when they come off the court, they went back to second class citizenship, right? And went to segregated neighborhoods and couldn't date, you know, the white cheerleaders and you know, all um, of the, right. the, the world of 1951 rural Arizona and segregation. You know, the, the guy that the guy that was the 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 star of the team who just turned 90 years old and I went to his Oh my gosh. Party. It was an incredible thing. I went to his birthday party. But that guy, um, his name was Fito Trujillo. Uh, went off to college, like uh, like several of the players, went off to college, got a degree, came back, wanted to become an accountant um, at the at the mining company there uh, that, that kind of ran the town. And they wouldn't hire him as an accountant. They wouldn't hire him in the offices because he was Mexican. They said, you know, sorry, you can work down in the pit, but you can't, you know, be an accountant, right? And um, 
and he ended up getting the last laugh because he he went from that and eventually started his own business and then became a, a county supervisor and was extremely successful and so it may have been the best thing you know <laughs> ultimately to happen to him but but that was the town and right and i and i loved writing about the contrast between their world on the court and and, and off the court it was kind of a it was kind of a mexican american versus a version of of of, of Hoosiers. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Except well, I, actually, I actually grew up, I grew up um like five minutes away from the town where Hoosiers was yeah. that basketball team. So now take Hoosiers and just add a civil rights spin to it uh and replace Dennis Hopper with no, I don't know who replaced Dennis Hopper. You can't replace <laughs> Dennis Hopper. <laughs> if I ever made a movie about this, I would still want Dennis Hopper in this movie, you know, just like <laughs> right. <laughs> He makes wow. everything be better, but yeah. yeah, no, I mean he does make everything better. But you know, but I think that's so interesting when you kind of they were celebrities, but still superstars for that superstars, time. but then it's kind of held to this completely other standard once they got off the court. Yeah, and to this day, you meet somebody from that town who's anywhere close to the it, like children of you know the people who were ball, ball players. It's like. It's the single most amazing thing that's ever happened to that. It's like Elvis came to town and and had you know and had Elizabeth Taylor on his arm and they got drunk and people are still telling stories you know about how they partied with them at a bar. It's just like they they have not they this is like the moment, right? right. The shining moment. Uh, and but they have that museum because they actually had like a long tradition of great sports teams. You know, so that right. I remember it wasn't just about that one team. No, I mean, there were all no, these athletes. No, no there's, yeah, there's a lot of other stuff that went on. In fact, at the 90 year old 90th birthday party for Fito Trujillo, I met Ed Long, who's 96, who was the center on the 1944 or 46 basketball team. You know, so yeah, so the long tradition. Okay. So then, okay, so quick. So any reason why they chose the name the Vandals? I mean, because you've got the criminals over in Yuma. Yeah. And it's just so funny that you've got the criminals versus the vandals. <laughs> Vikings. They were, vandals are Vikings, weren't they? I mean, they weren't they like weren't they like some form of Viking or something? Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I it's know. like the, they were Nordic, right? They were Nordic. I don't know who who yeah who picked, so. who picked the name. You know, <laughs> no one knows where mascot names come from. Yeah. It indeed just that yeah. was a Scottsdale Community College, the Artichokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was actually an act of defiance but not, yeah it's say, like not a, not a very vir virile sports <laughs> right exactly oh, look, there's an art joke <laughs> yeah okay anyway. all right okay. question four what was the single most stringent anti-immigration bill passed in arizona's history send bill 1070 which indeed which which I have a show called 1070, We Were Strangers Once Too, which is not a comedy because this was the worst and, and most horrific uh, piece of legislation that ever came out of the Arizona legislature. Um, well, until until recently, I should say. But until, uh, but, but uh, and, and sorry, and I wrote a play about it because 2010 was when that bill passed and it changed everything in Arizona. It changed mm -hmm. politics, it changed the economy, it, 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 it inspired dozens, if not hundreds, of Latinos to run for office, many of whom are now serving in office. It, I, there's a direct line that can be drawn from the passage of SB 1070 to the election, ultimately, of Mark Kelly and Kirsten Sinema uh, and, and the victory of, of Joe Biden. Uh, and I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. There's a direct line that can be because of the activism that was sparked and the, response right. to it, and the backlash. Um, and by and just for and, and by the way, in that play, um, uh, it's a full length play uh, and it centers around an undocumented uh, young woman, a DACA dreamer recipient uh, who's um, trying to protect her family throughout it all. And she's an activist. And, um, and it has a Sheriff Joe Arpaio character and a Russell Pierce character. And, you know, so it tries to cover a lot of ground. Yeah. And I mean, and I think it was interesting because it's like there were lots of um, we got lots of media attention. Um, oh, global, global. Right, exactly. I mean, global. I had a friend, um, a college friend um, who was with Al Jazeera at the time, was here following a woman, a young woman through her prom and that it was going as 1070 was going through and what was going on in her family as the midst as she's trying to get ready for prom. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. There, were all, there were all these stories coming out 
about different ways that 1070 was affecting people's lives. Oh, I worked at the time by coincidence, right around that time, I worked for the Arizona Hispanic Chamber of Commerce doing communications for them. And literally, I was taking calls from Japan and Belgium and Switzerland and Germany. I mean, from all over the world and Mexico, of course, and all over the U.S. I mean, we it, it, it garnered global attention. And the sad, sad fact is, and, and I've been in journalism a long time, so I know how this works, but a story explodes and it's on all the 24 hour news channels and, you know, Russell Pierce and Governor Brewer are on TV saying, you know, it's like, yeah, we got to get rid of these people. They're just ruining America and Arizona and all of that sort of stuff. And then, you know, the, the controversy eventually blows, you know, they go to another news cycle and nobody ever comes back to find out what happened 10 years later, right? The fact that there was all this empowerment that came as a result of 1070, that there was, you know, as ugly and as harmful and as damaging as it was, um, there was a spinoff, this reaction that changed politics in Arizona forever. No one really comes back to do that story. Some people have, there have been a couple of folks, you know, and, um, but uh, uh, people generally don't. And so, so the image, that a lot of people still to that to this day all over the world and all over the country is that Arizona, yeah, that's the show us your paper. You, you can't go there unless you got a passport. You know, even if you're coming from Indiana, right? You know, I'm like, no, you know. At one point, the Kaiser Family Foundation, which does national surveys, at one point asked survey respondents all over the country, "Where do you confront racism the most?" And you would think people would say, "Oh, at school or at work or." number one answer was Arizona. Oh. It's like, that's the impression it left on, on the country. Yikes. Yeah, stunning. We're still and, the and, and then you realize, well, you're right, and no one ever comes back to tell the story about what happened after that. Um, and they just kind of leave it there. But it's like, we're far more than just the headlines. That's why I always yeah. tell people, it's like, that. that's part of why I start doing what I'm doing. And doing this is trying to just share those stories that tell the next the, the continuing story yeah of yeah. so much yeah yeah no there's there's the, the stories are always more complex and you know and unfortunately they the the, the complex stories don't um, garner uh, the quick headlines right yeah all right so question five who is the only puerto rican ever appointed to the u.s supreme court sonia Zotamayor. Indeed. And so do you have any projects? Uh, I had, uh, I have a workshop one act version of, uh, of her based on her book called uh, My Beloved Life, My Beloved World, I should say. And uh, it's a beautiful book, by the way, that I recommend that tells her life story up until she becomes a federal judge because Sonia Sotomayor doesn't want people to read about her life post that because they don't, she doesn't want people to sort of say, oh, that's why she ruled on this case or that case or whatever. This sort of speaks to her kind of ethical standards, right? She basically said, yeah, I have an interesting life and I'm going to tell it, but I'm going to stop from, you know, at the point where I become a federal judge, which is a lot of time, right? That you don't you know, get to sort of hear about. Um, but she's just a, such a, a brilliant, thoughtful uh, human being. Uh, and uh, but grew up in a really fascinating life, right? Single mom. Uh, she had uh, uh, childhood pediatric diabetes. Uh, you know, um, ended up somehow getting herself into uh, I think it was Yale, then Princeton, and you know, and and, um, and and arrived there to discover all of the stuff that she didn't know because she wasn't at a very good school, but she was just brilliant, and so she got a big stack of books and caught up. And you know, she's just this astounding uh, human being. And, um, and, and so I have a one act version of a, of, of, a pl of a play that I'm trying to convince her people, right? <laughs> Can you let me turn this into a full length play and, and, uh, and produce it uh, with your blessing? And so far they haven't bitten. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope they do because I mean, I think, you know, more and more people want to see themselves on stage. They want to see the representation. And yeah, I think- yeah, exactly. and, and just the fact that she's gone through so much as opposed to just, oh, she's a she's on the Supreme Court. It's like, well, but it was that didn't just happen. There are yeah. lots of trials, and tribulations you had to go through to get there. Yeah. 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 And, my, and I think my piece is, is very tastefully done. I mean, it really does just uh, it just adapts her her uh, her memoir. And, um, uh, and and people have enjoyed it. And I think it's a good story. But I also understand where her people are coming from, because she is a Supreme Court justice now. And so they're probably protective of like her image in you know every way possible. Right. 
which I, I get, I get that completely. All right, so question six, what is a pastorella? A Mexican theatrical performance used to convert the means to Catholicism. And, and this is a bit of a euphemism, okay? <laughs> because if you know anything about uh, colonialism and, and the history of Catholicism uh, and the Spaniards uh, in Latin America and Mexico, there's a lot of brutality. Uh, there's actually a book um, written by a Hawaiian uh, scholar called American Holocaust. It's not, and it's not an overstatement. By his estimates, somewhere in the range of 20 million indigenous people lost their lives uh, as a result of all of the colonialist acts that from combined, you know, not wow. just Spaniards. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and people just, you know, died in droves. And, um, but in, the, but in the process, of course, the Spaniard, Spaniards and which were like this, of course, with the Catholic church at the time, right, that there was no separating them, uh, wanted to make sure that these heathens got converted. Uh, and they tried every means possible, including, you know, burning people at the stake and hanging them and enslaving them and so on and so forth. Uh, but then they also had this kinder, gentler approach, you know, Hey, let's write a musical. Let's have a little play about it, right? You know, <laughs> let's have a play with music that talks about Jesus, you know, and, and all of that sort of stuff. And so that's what the pastorellas were really ultimately is, is they were this teaching tool, right, that, um, uh, that spoke to these issues. And it was basically the nativity story, right? But they kind of did it with, um, and they, they also incorporated brown figures and brown personages and ultimately later the Vita de Guadalupe and, you know, um, who, Vita de Guadalupe, who, by the way, did not exist until after the Spaniards arrived here, right? You know, so, <laughs> so it was like, see the connection? <laughs> <laughs> there was no Vita before. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was a Black Madonna, right? You know, before that, there was a Black Madonna, right? True. So it just depended on where in the world they were trying to do you know, conversions. Right? So the pastorella, um, the pastorella was that. All right. And then the next question is, what is an American pastorella? American pastorella is, is uh, there, there has grown in the last few decades a tradition in Mexico, um, which used to have much more repressive government. Uh, now, now the most repressive force in, in Mexico, of course, are the international narcotics traffickers, right? Um, they'll kill anyone for any reason. But the government uh, is a little softer than it used to be. <laughs> and they're actually more or less practicing um, a reasonable version of democracy. And uh, But back when they were really tough, it was hard to express your views politically. And the pastorellas became this way. Uh, uh, they would essentially take the, uh, the pastorellas and, and convert them, if I may say, to a satirical... Um, uh, a, a, a satire and would uh, essentially lob criticism at the, at the government and government leaders and power structure and so forth. And then eventually that spilled over um, into the United States and the Southwest and um, different places around the country like San Diego and Tucson and Denver. You can find um, Americanized versions of the pastorella and that this is um, American pastorella. And I should tell you briefly, the premise is always the same um, and then comedy ensues. So the familia Hernandez lives in Altar, Sonora. They hear, they hear about something that prompts them to walk to Phoenix. Uh, and why do they walk? Because if they took a train or a plane, it would, the play would be over in like no time at all. So they have to walk, right? And they have to meet people in the desert and there's comedy skits. And, um, and, and how come they're able to walk and not get stopped by the Border Patrol? Because they all got amnesty during the Reagan administration, you know, so... So they're, you know, they're coming across legally, right? Okay. And, and then they have to come to the U.S. for some particular reason and arrive and, you know, um, and comedy ensues. <laughs> 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 All right. So his question eight, Hispanic Heritage Month is September 15th to October 15th. And why should anyone who's not Hispanic care? And pretty much, I mean, as we had talked, it's all of these. It's all of these. Hispanics care about you. We really do. <laughs> we really <laughs> love you, guy, big guy. <laughs> because the beer manufacturers have latched on to everything like they always do, and they've turned Hispanic you know, Heritage Month into a you know a big uh, sales pitch, um, like Cinco de Mayo, which they've also uh, uh, absorbed, and uh, and then uh, and and also because now. Uh, we're at nearly one in five uh, people in the United States of America are Latinos, um, all backgrounds, right? But um, 
one in five Americans, 62.6 million, you should care. Um, uh, and I think I had uh, mentioned this earlier that there is a, um, there's, this, there's a, a number out there that says that this community now uh, accounts, if it was, if you're talking about its gross domestic, domestic product, accounts for $3 trillion, which would make it the fifth largest country in the world if it was its own country and its own economy. Right? Wow. So those are real dollars, right? And so you should care. Because you're probably, if you're out, like if you're out there and you're in the business world, if you're Cox Communications or, or Budweiser or, uh, you know, any anything out there, and you're trying to sell stuff, um, you need to be selling stuff to Latinos. Right. And by the way, uh, for those of you who think um, uh, our education system in Arizona sucks, which it really kind of does, um, if you don't educate these children now, who are fifty percent. Of the of the public school population in Arizona, if you don't educate educate them now and do it well, guess what's going to happen, right? Twenty years from now, they will be adults, uh, and they will be a major part of your tax base, and they may or may not be doing a particularly good job if they're not well educated, right? And so it's in everyone's interest that they get educated, right? Yeah. Okay, that's me on my Latino soapbox. <laughs> I don't know how to say soapbox. Caja de jabón. I think is how you say soapbox. Oh, all fun. right. Getting all fancy. All right. So, question nine: What jobs has James E. Garcia held in his long and dubiously illustrious professional career? <laughs> I have a feeling it's all of those above. <laughs> it is all of the above. All of the above. And of course, people are going to say, wow, you were a farm worker? And yes, I was a farm worker, a fleetingly a, a farmer. When I lived with my mom young, we picked potatoes in South Texas and cotton in West Texas. And um, I didn't do it um, uh, as a young adult or adult. So, um, but I was a child farm worker. I was a child laborer, and I'm sure that all kinds of labor laws were being broken at the time. You know, no one else <laughs> watermelon in South Texas. But, you know, it's like we were there. The family was there. It's like, hey, let's get some potatoes. You know, let's, let's get some you know, boxes of potatoes and make some money. Um, playwright, yeah, factory working in Indiana, in Warsaw, Indiana. I worked at an iron foundry uh, briefly for about six months because oh. I was getting paid. I was getting paid $18 an hour. This was like a lot of money at the time. I was say that was a kid. lot of money. I was a kid and I was getting paid $18 an hour, but it was horrific. It was like working in a, in a coal mine. I mean, literally, you came out coffee and black, black dust, right? Oh. Um, university professor, which I still occasionally do sometimes when, when they'll have me. Uh, been a journalist um, since the mid-'80s. Uh, wow. Started in Laredo, Texas. Uh, and then I was briefly a prison librarian uh, when I was a teenager because, I, uh, like a lot of kids uh, growing up in rural uh, Indiana at the time, uh, I smoked weed and did coke and all the other stuff and got busted and uh, so spent a little time in the Indiana uh, Youth Center, uh, whose only other claim to fame is that um, uh, Mike Tyson uh, was there for a while. Not when I was there, because if he was there, I would have kicked his ass. But he, he wasn't there when I was there. <laughs> but but I, I, I credit my experience then. I was uh, 20, 20 and 21 and um, when I went there. I credit that with sparking my interest in reading. I read 100 books a year for a while and eventually um, went to started uh, uh, male correspondence courses at Indiana University. And uh, and so um, uh, while um, well, I, I don't wish that to happen to anyone and I should certainly wish there could have been a way I'd avoided it, but uh, it set me on a path uh, to uh, loving words and using words uh, to make a living and uh, and I'm sure had uh, everything to do with me becoming a playwright. Um, in fact, then I was reading a lot of Hemingway, uh, which, you know, love or hate Hemingway. I was reading Hemingway uh, and, um, and, and made the connection between a novelist and journalist and thought, you know, oh, maybe I could do something like that to journalism and some other creative work. And for me, it ended up being playwriting, not um, okay. novel. So. Yeah, but I was the prison librarian just briefly, you know, there. For, wow. <laughs> which is a cushy job, as you can imagine, right? Because otherwise you're working, you know, in the laundry, the laundry or in the kitchen. Or, or well, see, it was funny. So I was, so I got my um, master's in library of science at IU. Mm -hmm. In the university then, in Bloomington? 
Bloomington and then moved to New York City where I was a public librarian for about a decade oh. and actually worked um, side by side with some prison librarians. Wow. So you you get me. <laughs> well, it, it's so funny. I mean, you kept talking about Indiana and prison. And I was like, yeah. I was like, and it's like, and you know, and it was like, and the, New York had a long standing kind of history of basically public librarians going in and doing work in the prison system to just do exactly yeah. what you were talking about, helping yeah. to educate folks and get them to realize that, you know, there are other things out there. Yeah. And so just like you did, it's like kind of taking that moment and turning this horrible moment into something that was um, positive for your life. Yeah. yeah. And what I got almost immediately after I had been busted and came down from all the drugs that I was on <laughs> was what I got was that, was that what I was doing uh, and you know, people may, may not agree with this, but what I was doing uh, for all practical purposes uh, was no different than what a bartender does every day when they, you know, uh, slam beers and tequila and stuff across the bar and, and feed people bad intoxicants and they all get drunk and, and some of them go out and kill people in cars and go down. So I wasn't doing anything different than that. What I was doing that was um, the shameful thing, if you will, was I was wasting my life. I was just wasting. You know, there was no purpose. There was no function. It was just, oh, we're going to have a party this weekend. And, oh, you know, I'm going to you know, use some of the cash that I got, you know, to go buy a whatever, you know, a car that maybe at my age I shouldn't have. Whatever. But I was just wasting, wasting my life. And, and nothing worse, you know, than a wasted life. Life is too precious. Life, you got to be something. You got to contribute, right? And uh, and so that's that's what really, like, sparked in my head. And I said, you know, whatever I go from here, I can't waste it. It's, it's just too valuable. And uh, so I went on a different path. And here you are. And here I am. Here I am, not wasting my life by being on your show. <laughs> <laughs> and doing all kinds of things. I mean, writing about Royal H. Castro and yeah, yeah, and trying to tell different stories. I mean, because I mean, that's, I mean, life is full of stories. Yeah, it's full of stories. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's cliche, but, but to me, life has to have just, has to have a purpose. And so I, I literally wake up in the morning and I ask myself, what am I going to do today that's going to occupy my time that, you know, has, that has some purpose. It's contributing something, even if it's in a small way. You know, doing something and and I think it's important. I would agree with that. All right. And then our last question is what does the E in James E. Garcia stand for? <laughs> Eduardo. Yeah. This allows me to tell just a brief story about my mother. My mother, who I probably got my creative streak from, um, uh, is now 93 uh, and living in rural Louisiana. And but um, my mother, uh, who came to the United States, she was born in Chicago, grew up in Mexico, came across. And when she came, um, she had she she grew up Mexican. So she had to learn what it meant to be an American kind of all over again, including English. And um, and I'm convinced that she when she started naming her children, she thought I need to somehow equip them for life in the United States of America. And so she gave us all these bizarre names like. Javier Fernando Garcia was the most Mexican name, but then there was Arthur uh, Arturo uh, Robert Garcia, and then it was James Eduardo Garcia. So she was doing kind of all this bilingual stuff that I think she, in her in her head, somehow let us keep some of our culture and allowed us to, you know, kind of acculturate or assimilate on some level as well. Um, but well, she yeah, learned, right. uh, yeah. But she learned. Um, she, and I've written about her in, in theater, and but she and she learned English from from uh, watching television, so uh, so she had a lot of TV catchphrases, you know, that were part of her um, lexicon. <laughs> <laughs> what you yeah. talking about, Willis? <laughs> yeah, things like that, like that's cooking with gas, or it's the real thing, uh, you know. So like these are like old school references from TV and stuff. Like that. Yeah, and uh, and so she was she was she has a piece of work, and um uh, and, uh, and and took me to school. Uh, when I only spoke Spanish uh, in the first grade, only spoke Spanish, took me to school, left me there. Um, they realized I didn't speak any English, and they they took me out, sat me on the front steps of the stool, and called my mom and told him told her, "Don't bring him back until he learns English." Right? Which which uh, I don't remember how she did it, but I'm sure it wasn't an easy task, given the fact that she barely spoke English. Right? So right. somehow she managed um, to. 
to give me enough skills so that I could get back in school. Uh, wow. The public school system. So, but that was common then. That was common. Yeah. Well, right. And, and a lot of like first generation, re- regardless of the background, it's like they try to assimilate the kids. So that's why it's like, you know, hardly any um, of the native tongue is spoken. Yeah. You know I mean, and yeah. so it's against the rules. It was against the rules on campus. It was, yeah. That kind of thing. I mean, they all you know, basically they're all saying it's like, no, you're you're learning about uh, uh, Jefferson and Washington and Adams. And and so you should speak their language. <laughs> you know, because they are the models. You know? And then it wasn't crystal many years later. I was like, did they own slaves? Was that like an issue? I don't know. It seems like an issue, you know, but, <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you know, but that's all part of that story. And, you know, and there's always more to the story. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there's always more to the story. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I always like to end trivia with asking people how they did. And also reminding them that, you know, it's not how many you got right or wrong, but look at the stories. I mean, we now know more about Raul H. Castro Mm -hmm. than we did before. I mean, the fact that he was a hobo and a judge. So, you know, I want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories, your personal stories and about things that your passion. Well, thank you. No, thank you. I, so this I has been know. a lot of fun. I so, love I always, this stuff. so thank you so much for coming on and sharing. And have a great rest of your night. Okay, thank you so much. It was an thank honor. You. It was an honor to be on. Thank you so much, Marshall. I really thank you. That. Bye. Oh my gosh! You know. Thank- we go all right so you know james thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories as we all just get to learn a little more about arizona i mean and who so thank you so much all right so from the vault so kind of as we're talking hispanic heritage month one of the things i thought that would be kind of interesting is if you're ever out on indian school way going 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 you're in avondale if you take a turn south on north santa fe trail you'll come across the goodyear farm cemetery and that really talks about goodyear and the goodyear cotton but they grew but it became farms and so they brought in all these workers from across the border and outside of arizona to work those farms. And with that um, 1918, a pandemic hit, which I'm sure we've heard a lot about that in the last couple of years. But when that hit, there were so many folks who wound up passing away in huge numbers. And so a lot of them were buried here. Now, some were buried in unmarked graves, some were buried in marked graves. But what I think is interesting about the cemetery is, is that A, They've installed this really interesting work of art that now lets you know that right in the middle of what would have been the labor camps for the workers is now this cemetery in the middle of kind of a suburbia. And it is a working cemetery, so you will still find recent graves and modern headstones. So now you'll see why I always suggest that you click on share if you're on Facebook, because we are having so much fun with Arizona history. So thank you so much. Now, next week, we are coming from Route 66 with Josh Noble up in Kingman as, the, as he is like literally the next day talking about the, sing, the Kingman 66 Fest. So that's going to be a lot of fun as we have trivia about Route 66 and more to the story there. So that's why, you know, if you ever have any questions, story suggestions, please reach out. I love to hear from you all. That's how I get some of my best stories. And some of my guests have come directly from suggestions you have made. So please reach out. I love to give a shout out to not just Chris and Cole, who did that intro, but also PJ, who always comes up with something and educating me. And here's to National Orange Wine Day. Now, as we say goodnight, I'm going to leave you with a montage of 
some film clips that actually came from an estate sale I went to that I did several years ago, a installation. So here we go. Have a great rest of your night and I will see you back here next Thursday. And we're going to talk about Route 66. Oh, 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 oh,